we know that there's a climate emergency. And in fact, it's very relevant to woodland of all kinds because um, there's no guarantee that we'll hold the global <clears throat> heating to two degrees, three degrees, four degrees as we reach tipping points. And then we could see all woodlands subject to forest fires, devastating impacts. Um, it, Charlotte, I'm, I'm loving the expression on your face. Um, it, the United Nations isn't guaranteeing that we'll limit clim climate change to two, two and a half, three or 3.7 degrees. And so that's why we're here urgently trying to um, restrain it through unilateral action. I mean, China itself uh, is doing more than we a lot of people think. I think that Xi Jinping has got it in the same sense as Al Gore. He understands that climate change, if it goes bad, will wipe out his entire population or, or all the ones in the lowlands, which is most of them. So um, we can't say, oh, let other people do it. Let the islands do it. Let the UK government do it. In our communities in Wiltshire, in our towns, villages, hamlets, um, in the UK, in um, other countries, everyone's got to be doing what they can and asking all levels of government to do what they can. I've just got uh, one or two um, images for you. And one of them, if I can share, is, um, is um, an unprecedented um, increase in um, sea temperatures. So the light gray lines, can anyone see this? Represent different years um the temperature of the sea through the years um the um black line shows the um integrated temperature of the ocean surfaces around the world um except for the um except for the arctic and antarctic and it's reached an unprecedented level and it does have some scientists worried so it does seem as if we're entering into an accelerated um period of of global heating and um, I just hope that that doesn't depress people and make them go away and, um, and, and despair or enter into doomism, but galvanize us to, to uh, be more assertive with the government, with Wiltshire Council and so on, and do what we can. And we'll be coming to how we can organize better as a, as a group. The other image, if I can find it, um, is um, about the, um, the problem of what people will do and uh, what's the remedy to this it's tell people more get them to tell the truth but take a look at this um great britain is the bright red or deep red blobs um so a lot of people over well over 50 percent are willing to only eat seasonal fruit and vegetables notwithstanding the huge demand and shortage. Andrew, you haven't changed your slide mate i haven't changed the slide um i'll stop the share and start the share again sorry um if I can get that one, um, technology defeats us all. There, um, this is the one. Are you seeing some colored blobs? All right. Um, yep. All I'll say now is that some changes to our lifestyle, people are very willing to make single use plastic, the, the, veg the out of season vegetables, and then some are middling, switching to electric car, paying extra for your flight, using active travel and some at the bottom two are people in all those european countries are rather reluctant currently to go vegan and rather reluctant to regulate the number of children they have in response to the climate emergency um so this is what we're working with uh, real people who have real preferences and are willing to go so far and no further um i'm going to uh stop sharing now and hand over to the people who want to report to to us about the big one um, rally in London. Unless anyone's got any questions or comments, and can they be brief on on what I um, just presented? I'll be able to post links to all these resources, by the way. So that's over to the next person. Thanks very much. Present, I've got on the agenda um, attendees' feedback after the big one rally in London. How are we managing this, guys? You want to do that, Bill? Richard, do you want to give give us some instant feedback? Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to. Um, yeah, I was I was up there for the for the whole time and um, was 
uh, pretty intricately involved with the um, organization of it. So, um, yeah, absolutely massive, uh, particularly the Saturday, which was the biodiversity day the, on, on Earth Day. Um, we've crunched the numbers now. 68,000 people attended the, um, the that day, the Saturday, the biggest thing that XR has ever done. Um, and the exciting thing was that, of course, we we weren't there on our own. Uh, we had over 200 supporting organizations, many of whom turned out. And, and the Saturday was just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Families, children, grandparents, just everybody was there. Chris Packham was, you know, he gave a really good speech at the start of it basically castigating all the people that weren't there from the um from the uh from the if you like the ngos that perhaps he felt ought to have been there um and uh, promoted it to to their membership rather more uh, rather more proactively um but um i mean my takeaway from it is that you know i think uh, what we did there, you know, we, in terms of Extinction Rebellion, by saying that, uh, you know, we we were going to make it a a safe, accessible and inclusive protest so that we could get the maximum number of people to attend. It was it was really proactively pre-liaised with the police. Um, we had seven meetings with the police in advance uh, and, you know, we had constant dialogue with them through through it as well and debriefed afterwards. And basically, the, the the outcomes from a policing perspective were that we had um, no arrests and no complaints from the local community. So that is pretty special, actually. Uh, in when you think about it in the in the context of the uh, of the if you like the the assault on on climate activists, which is ongoing right now, both uh, from the government with the with the um, with the Public Order Act, as it now is, um, and uh, and the right wing media, um, so actually, you know, I think there's a formula there um, that we can build on. Uh, I don't know what's what's going to happen next, what we do, but um, one of the key things for me was the fact that you know, what do we do next was a key part of the the, the four days. And one of the things um, was to mobilize in our local communities. Um, and um, and that's what we're that's what we're doing tonight. That's what that's why we're here, isn't it? You know, to be able to do things in our local communities, um, which will, uh, you know, I mean, Andrew, you know, pointedly pointed pointed to the, you know, the potential for doomerism here, um, you know, that, that it's all lost. We're going to lose everything. Well, no, I, 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 we, we can't. You know, we, 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 we've got to do all we can, uh, and I think locally is the best place to do that. It's much more accessible for people, um, you know, to to do stuff on their doorsteps. And I, and you know, I, I think that's what Wiltshire Climate Alliance is all about. And there are so many projects where we can make an impact in our local area, and I think that's what we really must continue to do. So. I won't go on about the big one, but it was phenomenal. Um, I have to say I'm quite tired still from it, but it, it exceeded our expectations. We did, we reckon, get the 100,000 people that we were looking to achieve on the streets of London during the course of the four days. And I think we sent a very powerful message. Um, and it was a it was a, a privilege to be part of, frankly. So that that that's my takeaway from it. Short and sweet. You mute, Andrew. So, thank you so much, Richard, from to hear from the horse and someone behind the scenes on the in the organizing group. Julie. Yes, hello. Um, we had a, an amazing piece of press coverage on uh, the uh, big one. For the first time, the Salisbury Journal has covered um, a great. Uh, well, it, it's covered something in a completely. Um, total way, I'd say. So I don't know if any of you have seen it, but. There was a link in the uh, members um, uh, invite, the, the invite to this meeting, 
However, if you'd like me, can I, can I share my screen a minute, Julian? Is that all right? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, I'll, I'll show you the. Um, I'll show you this now. Um, show you the actual article, which I showed a couple of members who came earlier um, to the early session. So, can you see that? So, this is this is the article. Um, we provided, well, I think Nick Murray took most of these photos and, and Christian Lange and uh, I think there are some from Phil as well. Um, so this, this has gone in uh, last week into, it's online, so it's there right now. What's really, really nice about it is it, it's very positive, obviously. It, it, it's so important to get the truth out about what's going on at these rallies and, and stop all the, um, the fear and anxiety associated with them. Um, and so uh, in the comments, there was an initial naysayer. Uh, I don't know if you know this guy, Big John O, but um, we've, uh, there are several replies here that counter what he was saying very, very well. And if anyone would like to add their voice to this, please do. We'd really need everyone to step up and share it, share it with as many people as you think would like to read it, and um, also to um, add your comment to the day if you were there. I think I don't think everybody went from, the, uh, obviously, from the Climate Alliance, but those that, that did go, please share their, your views, because as eyewitnesses, it's very valid. That's all I wanted to say, sorry. Sorry for butting in. <laughs> Um, did anyone go go who wished they hadn't bothered? And did anyone uh, wish they had gone and, and couldn't make it? Okay, wonderful. Um, and that was a brilliant press release, um, Julie and team, which provoked that article in, in the Salisbury Journal, wasn't it? Any other um, flashes? I, I, I'll just give you this one in the chat. I've, I've been saying, in, instead of saying, how can I possibly make any difference? Ask yourself, how many differences, I got that wrong, how many differences can I possibly make? This thing about the climate emergency and the doomism, every small thing you do, but especially any big thing you do, makes a difference. And any degree or fraction of a degree of global warming that we stave off, us personally and people like us across the world, makes a difference. It makes a difference to millions of people's lives saved. It makes a difference to numbers of species rescued from extinction. It makes a difference to to catastrophe um, being smaller or just un unimaginably larger. So everything can make a difference. And what we want to come to a little bit um, in a little bit of, of time this evening is talk about um, how we can group together in little project teams. I've got someone whose name is User, and I'm sorry I don't know your name, sorry. Um, do, do speak up now if you unmute. Um, it's actually it's actually Jonathan Robertson on my sister's computer on St. B, so it made me use it. Um, first say I'm really sorry we couldn't be there because we were away. And um, but what struck me is I mean, so often the activists are, are accused of why you're being dis disruptive, and you provided a really helpful thing for to say in the future when that's thrown at them, because as you say, nearly 100,000 people there, completely peaceful, no, no arrests, no nothing, and really relatively little coverage in the papers, the, the main papers and the news. Um, so I, even from that point of view, I think that's been really helpful. And I'm sure also lots of people who turned up for the Biodiversity Day, perhaps because they're RSPB members or whatever, who might never have come to an Extinction Rebellion thing in the future, I think will be feeling very encouraged and much more likely to take part. So hats off for organising it. OK, uh, what a great turnout it was. And uh, the fact that it didn't get as much news coverage as it might have in national, for instance, the BBC, might be because Terrible, terrible bad things didn't happen. We didn't disrupt the London Marathon. Nobody died. Nobody broke the law. Nobody um, was, a, a, you know, arrested as far as I know. I mean, people die at, at uh, Glastonbury Festival, but actually, apparently, it's less people die in Glastonbury Festival than sitting at home that weekend. So 
to, uh, to have this event which was safe, which was friendly, which was incredibly creative. And I really want to bring some of that creativity back to Watch Climate Alliance in our arts, new arts group activities over the next 12 months was, was a marvellous thing. Um, so nothing bad has come up in the conversation. We can move on to the next item on the agenda, shall we? He says, checking what that is, <laughs> which is Wiltshire Council, I think. Um, um, could I, Andrew? Yes. Could, could, there's also the third thing in item one is um, if any oh. other member groups want to um, uh, do brief climate related updates. And I've also got one on people in the park, unless there's anyone specifically from people in the park here, I'll, I'll relay that. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. And and are you still here, Deb and John, from um, uh, your location? Hullamington, is it? Um, is there anything you can want to ask us or, or update us on? Or are, are, are Deb and John not here? They said they could only stay till 7.15. That's a shame. So um, I'm, I beg your pardon. I want to um, uh, people to give give any update they'd like to do. And I think we're particularly keen at uh, this time because if there are any projects that, that seem to be or that are aim, aiming to make a real big difference to um, actual greenhouse gas emissions in Wiltshire, then we'd like to hear for, about them. We'd like to support them. We'd like to work with people more um, directly than we have done before. Um, I'm not seeing any hands going up. Andrew, bring his hands up. Okay, I've got, there's two screens of... Um, participants I'm seeing so I'm looking at the wrong one thanks Brig okay Brig. Uh, thank you Andrew can nice you hear me see. yes you can I should think um so I'm uh one of the organizers of people in the park in Salisbury um and my particular well, and for anyone who doesn't know, it's a, a lovely day out in Queen Elizabeth Gardens in Salisbury by the the river, and it's full of stalls from all sorts of voluntary groups and organisations within Salisbury. A um, couple of stages, a few local bands, and generally a, a lovely day out in the park for people with a, a green theme. Um, everybody's welcome and it's on the and it's free to attend and it's on the 20th of may saturday a couple of saturdays away um <clears throat> yes i'm i'm in charge of the the stewarding for um people in the park and i think claire's just uh put something up she's uh volunteered to be a a steward anyone else who wants to come along and, and be a steward um please get in touch with me i'll put my email in the uh in the chat um stewards are there to keep an eye on things and make sure everything is safe and, and that the organizers know if any emergency occurs if there's an accident or a, a fire breaks out or anything like that we haven't had any emergencies in the previous years but uh it's all part of our duty of care that we have stewards there who are keeping an eye out on things and also answering the, the questions like how do I get to Harnham and where can I get a cup of tea and so on. Um, and it's the events from 10 in the morning till uh, 4 in the afternoon. Um, we're hoping that people will steward for three hours, which will be a couple of hours on a fixed point in one hour on a, a roving steward team. Um, and that date again, then, Brig? That's the 20th of May. 20th of May. I'm going to ask Brig for an update he hasn't requested to give, which is, aren't you um, working incredibly hard to set up an eco hub um, in yes. Premier that's, that's the other sure. update I was going to give you, because um, <laughs> Salisbury Eco Hub Alliance is is a member of uh, WCA and uh, WCA is also a member of the uh, Salisbury Eco Hub Alliance uh, because uh, we can do that. We can the Eco Hub Alliance can have uh, individual members and members representing 
groups. And uh, so at the at the WCA event in um, Devizes um, a couple of months ago, uh, we made sure that we we joined WCA and got WCA to join us. Um, we're trying to set ourselves up as a charity. We're waiting for um, our application to be processed by the Charities Commission, and they've had it since the middle of January, and it's holding us up a bit, but they haven't done it yet. Um, but we, the idea of the Eco Hub Alliance is that we bring together all the different groups in Salisbury that are doing different things for the environment and for climate change. Um, and it's a, a tremendous range of groups that goes everywhere from XR through Salisbury Transition City and POGS, the cycling group, and uh, even the uh, Salisbury Christian Aid and uh, the Allotment and Gardens Association. Okay, I'll, so, put, I'll put a link in the chat, Brig. Um, I don't know if it's the best link. Um, transition salisbury.org slash eco hub is that a good link to follow yeah um, brilliant and I, yeah, i'm so jealous because i'd love to see one in the county town of trowbridge <laughs> yeah well our problem at the moment is that we still haven't managed to get the the city council or the county council to give us any premises but we do have a, a stall in salisbury market every uh, saturday um not this Saturday, because we think people will be uh, probably watching the coronation, but there's on Tuesday, no, Monday, sorry, Monday, bank holiday Monday, um, there's a big help out thing in uh, yeah. Salisbury Guildhall Square, and we'll be there and also hoping to sign up some more volunteers to steward people in the park when we're there. Um, but there is one thing that I'd like to say more um, about it is that um, Wiltshire Climate Alliance as an organisation has joined uh, Salisbury Eco Hub Alliance, but when it comes to us having a, a, big, an, a big annual general meeting and electing the trustees of our charitable trust, then Wiltshire Climate Alliance, because it's a member, will have a vote. But we haven't got a nominated person for uh, Wiltshire Climate Alliance to be the one who receives the paperwork and comes and wields that vote, or even nominates someone else to come and do it on their behalf, because any member can appoint a proxy for that. And it, it's just a bit of tying up the, um, the paperwork and so on to comply with the uh, constitution and so on. So, if there's anyone here who would like to be Wiltshire Climate Alliance's official voting member of the um, or voting representative for the Eco Hub Alliance, then please get in touch and we'll we'll make you that person. If no one's raising their hands, would you like the steering group to address this and uh, see if we can uh, sort yes, out? Yes, please. We, we originally asked Christian, but he said he's too busy. He doesn't want to take on something um, else. Now, Hannah, you, Griffin, you had a hand up. Uh, Julian, you had a hand up. Hannah, did you want to say anything at this point? Um, uh, um, no, sorry. I, I had my hand up about the um, big one. Um, I just had a yeah. question about that. Well, you're welcome to, I think um, you want to move, move on, don't you? Um, what was the question, if you, if people don't mind? Um, um, like... No, it's fine. Sorry, it might be opening a can of worms when you want to keep the meeting going. Um, it was just, um, I partly didn't go just because um, I kind of wanted to go, but I couldn't really in the end. But also just having been on so many marches like that over the years that didn't really do anything and then obviously in 2019 when we had all the disruptive stuff happening that really did um change things um so sorry <laughs> sorry to put a dampener on things it's just uh i'm just slightly confused because i thought the whole 
thing with XR was, you know, realizing, you know, as a result of all these studies of social movements and everything, that you had to be disruptive to um, have an impact. So I was just slightly confused. I think that was well worth hearing. And what we could do is, as well as having perhaps more debate about that at the end of the formal meetings, we sometimes, some of us stick around. Um, I, I think it's probably worth Richard um, giving us just a response, but but we can't do it, open up a debate. Richard, uh, you're muted. He's he's got his hand up, but he's just gone somewhere. Yes, um, Richard. Look, we won't um, neglect this. If you want to unmute and give us a a, a brief um, response to the, to the risk you has raised that we can talk about later at the end of the meeting. You're, you're unmuted, that's great, far away. Yeah, I'm really sorry, internet connection is absolute rubbish. Uh, but um, yeah, if, if I can stay connected, I think it's such a great question, Hannah, it really is. And um, you know, that's, that's the big dilemma at the moment, isn't it? It's like, but just to go back to the theory of change, um, I think the key part of the theory of change is the mobilization of three and a half percent of the population to take action um and i uh, clearly i think the the trajectory of continuing with you know the same old same old disruptive protest with fewer and fewer people attending um was never going to get that mobilization so it, you know it, it it's always been about the numbers and um the numbers i think are critical and it's you know, it's it's understanding how this particular government and any future government responds to pressure, because you have to apply pressure clearly. Um, my personal view is that by continuing with, um, if you like, some of the more disruptive, you know, pu pu you know, disrupting the public type actions will just harden um, harden the attitudes of of this particular government. And they will introduce more and more author authoritarian um measures to prevent any form of protest which potentially is completely com counterproductive uh so i think i think the emphasis really of the big one was to mobilize people outside of our our kind of xr bubble and say look come on this is you know unite to survive was the kind of slogan really and i think that's that's where we're at and what we have to do is build on that um that mobilization of numbers and just make sure that that continues. And then it's the numbers that in and of themselves apply uh, apply the pressure to the government to, if you like, accede to the demands, you know, the not unreasonable demands. I mean, they're not exactly radical, are they? Um, so that I think is would be my answer to that. Thanks There's still, you, still a place for, you know, direct action, disruptive action, because that's what gets in the news. Uh, that keeps the profile up and, you know, huge respect to Just Up Oil and all the others who are putting their freedom on the line to keep it in the medium. Thanks, Richard. I've got Mel's hand up and Julian, if you had a point still after that. Yeah, thanks. Um, mine's about something completely different, which is just feedback, really. Um, I went on a climate action day organised by Wiltshire Council on the 27th of March for parish councils, and it was really good. It was about 45 attended and we were just sharing common problems, you know, for example, flooding and, and what to do about it. I mean, rainwater harvesting at Great Bedwin, they got a grant from Wessex Water to actually, you know, connect it directly to houses, etc. Um, having a climate action plan for each parish, community gardens, reuse and repair outlets, electric vehicle points, using thermal cameras for insulation um to, to check on whether you've got poor insulation in your house lots of really good practical points but the key thing is you've got to have a climate action plan in each parish yeah thanks that's an, a really good development because like you said at the parish level all kinds of good things can happen and if parishes um are responsive to doing things then they can get a lot done and uh, i think we we're realizing that community area board funding from Wiltshire Council can take us a long way to doing things we're trying to do. So it's great to spend Wiltshire's money on uh, 
<laughs> helping Wiltshire to go to to go to net net zero carbon. Thank you so much, Mel. Now, Julian, did you still want to make a, a contribution? No, that's fine, I think we ought to move on. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. So we're moving on. Um, and who's who's taken the next bit? I'm sorry, I wasn't in the pre-meeting we have to organize this uh event. No, so. I'll share I'll share my screen for you, Bill. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks. Yeah, carry on. I'll do it okay. the next bit. I'll try and keep it brief as we're gonna run out of time, surely. Yeah, we're on 25 to 8. We want to finish around 8, yeah? If we can. Sorry, have you got it yet? Okay, thanks to Julie, that goes up for I don't mind yet. Um, just a quick run through, first of all, what I'm going to, what I'm going to talk about, that one's first, yeah. What I'm going to talk about is, is the, where the council have got to and in their, in their journey, if you like, through the, the climate strategy um, and where they are now in their latest report. So basically this is just a, a brief, last 12 months of what's happened in, in 2022 they finally signed off their uh, their climate strategy it was adopted by council at the same time they were employing a company called Anthesis, who produced a very detailed response uh on council plan to achieve net zero by 2030 for both the council and the county and they are very very good documents to look at so i think they're, they're still on their website there is a link somewhere around here which will take you to that point have a look at it if you want to but it's like 200 pages of report it's a but it's a very very detailed very comprehensive then what happened from that was the climate team in the council um de developed a comprehensive program for delivering what the emphasis report is recommending um in some instances i think we have to be careful there because i think they're, cha they're challenged in a number of areas they produced a list of 170 plus individual items to work on and then in quarter four, which climate task group, which is a councillor group, also an officer group. So the climate team is an officer group. The task group is councillors who look at what is going on in the officer domain, if you like, and report back. And so they look at the overview of the plan and the focus. Uh, the, the focus on that report was actually the use of council land for climate mitigation, which was quite interesting. They did that in November and they, they, they are actually moving forward in it, but very quietly. I think we need to poke them about that and try and find out a bit more. And then the climate team themselves reported to cabinet last week, I think it was, or maybe even more recently than that, but they reported to cabinet on how they, it, it had progressed since the September uh, report had gone out, there's 170 items. So they're delivering this through seven delivery areas, which are the ones below, cross-cutting, which cuts across all issues within the council and the county, with those 170 plus um, actions against those items. They're all very familiar items and I won't dwell on them. Um, and then the way that works is the plan will be delivered mainly to responsible departments in the council with the climate team advising, supporting and monitoring. So the council departments are responsible for delivering the climate needs um, for the council and the county. Bear in mind, they are doing both. The link underneath just gives you, um, and I'm sure we'll share these slides with you after the meeting. Next one, please. So very long list of some takeaways, but it's like a 50 page report of stuff. I'm not going to I'm not going to go through those in detail now, just have a look at them. But the app, if you go to the next slide, and I'm happy to, to, to come back to that, but this was my view of where those out, uh, outtakes got us to. So they, they got a real step up on actions identified. And there were lots of actions, but at all the small scale, like they had 210 homes retrofitted in the county against 120,000 needing retrofitting. So, you know, measuring progress of that scale isn't going to get us to where we need to be. 
And I think that's the point we need to be raising at WCA with the council that, yes, you're doing good work, but you need to do more good work to actually get us work to where we need to be. However, you can do that. Um, and then there's ownership of those actions and so 170 actions is really vague. So it doesn't give delivery responsibility to anybody. Um, there is clear engagement with other councils in the, in the country, and that's really good. And they're getting joint learning from that, but it's unclear having done that, what actions are benefiting the county. So they've got more work to do on that. And then all the status on, not all of them, that's not fair, but most of them have un, our own focus. So there's no smart driven uh, delivery pro profile on, on the item. And they did a lot more of that if they're gonna to get to where they need to be. Um, and the other point, this is a very detailed point, but in, in, pl in the planning sphere, they've started discussing things with the social housing providers, et cetera, and they are doing their own council houses. They're doing a thousand council houses in the next 10 years. All of them will be zero carbon, for example. But the developers, the engagement is incredibly low level at the moment, and they need to get developers on board to deliver is what we need with new houses. Next, please. Okay, so I know we're going to move on to this in a minute, but these are the sort of picking out the things that were in the report and suggesting we want to work with the council, with the council for joint working on certain things. Trees and hedgerows are a big issue. Uh, the new head uh, lady for, for, for climate uh, and the environment is really keen on developing that particular theme, and so are we. Uh, work with SSEN, that's for grid, grid and re reinforcement, et cetera, and local communities. Wind and solar, we need to push them really hard on that. Active travel, because they're very, very low on their priority list. And this year, a local plan will be coming out. I really need to be geared up dealing with that, because it is the key area that we will need to address. OK, that's me for the moment. Bill, can I just make a quick observation on that, uh, wearing my former councillor's hat? I wonder yeah, if you could scroll back a couple of slides very quickly, um, where you mentioned uh, that work, you've gone too far. OK, that'll do. Um, you talk about um, housing association retrofits, and you point out last bullet point, third party developer engagement at a, a low level. Yep. It, unfortunately, I don't think Wiltshire Council has the regulatory power to enforce, and it can only come through building regulations, a requirement for developers to fit new uh, builds to the sort of standards that you and I would think of uh, as acceptable in going towards a um, net zero situation. And I think um, this is one of the areas where, for example, were XR to organize another big one to look at much more focused um, targets like persuading government through uh, the Department of Environment, Communities, local government to change that legislation and enforce building regulations that make developers build houses with solar power, with grey water collection and a host of other measures. Um, I, and I think we're at the point now, rather than big sticks, um, looking at, at very specific targeted actions to get some of these things sorted. Yeah, Nigel, they could have a long conversation about that. Maybe we can go on after after the meeting a okay. little bit because those those issues to me are, are are key, and there's a lot behind that statement which I'd like to talk to you about. Super, Tony. Yeah, just a quick comment on that. Um, uh, Bath and North East Somerset have insisted now in their local plan to have um, net zero carbon housing. So there are precedents now with other councils to do that. So there's no no excuse now for for Wiltshire to say that it's 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 not uh, it will be challenged in the courts. Thanks. Um, I want to come in on this. I'm getting cynical as I get older, um, and I wanted to say two or three things. One is lack of leadership. One is lack of focus, and another is false claims of progress. So I think there's a lack of moral legal and political leadership. Nigel, I take your point, and yet I don't hear Wiltshire Council and its cabinet um, leading a drive to um, central government, a determined drive to um, 
get retrofitting able to be put into local plans as a requirement. I don't see um, them pushing out the boat and trying to put it in their local plan review, um, pushing the boundaries as some other authorities are in England. Um, I, I see Wiltshire Council saying, well, we won't um, be promoting wind, um, onshore wind turbines in Wiltshire if the public aren't ready to accept them. I don't hear the moral leadership saying, explaining to the public why these are so important um, from the point of view of uh, Wiltshire Council's stated resolution on, on driving the community to net zero by 2030. So that's uh, one of my cynical points. The, uh, another one is, um, to, uh, sorry, there's so many actions. Um, I'd like to see, you know, I, 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 had, a, I had a dream that um, we were going to execute council leaders who hadn't met their net zero targets and we're going to execute them in 2030. It was only a dream. All the worst things happen in dreams. Um, if uh, if that happens in China, the people heads really will roll. Not here, but I think holding people to account politically is not executing them. It's asking them to do what they stood for election to do. And um, if if the political leadership really felt that they were going to be in deep trouble. Um, in the 2030 local elections for lack of progress, um, I'd like to see them um, being more determined. And what you see, if you're managing this as a project, you'd say, where do we want to be? When do we need to be there? Where are we now? Here's the gap. Here's step, 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 fill the gap. Um, there was one other document we were shown when a couple of us met the um, the cabinet member and, and the head of the climate programme which was the update, which went to cabinet yesterday, I think. And it seemed to me cynically that uh, each of the council's teams, waste and transport and so on, had sent in a lot of brownie points. Oh, yes, we've got people reusing 65 gallons of paint. All right, that's going to help us in a in a very small way. But um, there was something that I picked out, which was that we're taking upholstered sofas out of the waste stream that's going to landfill and we're incinerating them. And they claimed that that was progress because um, they'd somehow saved X number of tons of CO2. And I thought, hang on, if we buried them, that, that would, carbon would still be sequestered in the soil, although it's more complicated than that because the upholstery is toxic. But since we've burnt them, that carbon has all been released now into the atmosphere. And I think there are some people in the, some of the council's departments that uh, that don't get it. And one last item in that six monthly climate update was about carbon literacy training for council officers. And they said, we are getting ready to start rolling it out. <coughs> and I thought, wait a minute, wasn't that one of the immediate actions that came in the climate strategy that they started writing in 2020? So um, I'm dissatisfied. And having smiled- Andrew, Andrew time, again, the, we, there's a lot of things to talk about there. And I'm, I'm just yeah. concerned that we're going to run out of time completely. Oh, uh, I, I, re I really agree with a lot sorry. of what you're saying, but there are some answers and some further questions. This That's could be a, a, so sorry, Julie. We could go on for another hour. <laughs> it's my fault. Um, go to go to Hannah. It's fine. Oh no, you say Julie. Sorry, you go. Uh, well, no, no. It, it's just to reiterate that um, Bill and Andrew and I met with the council last week, and we were just uh, able to read this report before we, we attended. So we didn't have much time to digest it fully, but we were very positive with them because we do feel that by working together, we can achieve more. And, and you know, being um, uh, positive and constructive is, is kind of where we've left it with them. And we, we also want to be very honest. So we will be going back with an update on the, their report and a, a suggestion on what we would want to do and what we want to focus on after our breakouts tonight. So really important, that's all. Um, sorry, shall I just come in quickly? Yes. Um, Please do, yeah, Hannah, yeah. Yeah, I, sorry, I just wanted to say really quickly, um, I think that sounds great, Judy, having that approach. And I think it is really good that you're holding to them, them to account. But I just wanted to say, in terms of local authorities, like just bearing in mind the context of austerity, that um, 
like staffing levels are just incredibly low just got to realize that local government is kind of at breaking point I would say and barely functioning in some areas because of austerity and just to bear that in mind <laughs> um so yeah push the councillors but you know that might be why officers aren't always delivering because um uh of that that's a good reality Thanks. Thanks. yeah okay should we move on because we, we've got to get on to yeah, the... So Julie, Julie, over to you. And I'm sorry, I apologize for having a rant earlier and taking up time. This won't take long. Um, so as part of the conversation with the council, so as it goes on from that, that nicely, um, we were talking about the, uh, the critical uh, point is really to engage the public and not to put the public off by speaking technically all the time and having... Um, you know, sort of climate anxiety going on all the time and shock, shock tactics, that sort of thing, because most people have had enough of all that, really, in their lives, one thing or another. So a really positive thing that came out of the meeting is we're going to have another meeting <laughs> to talk about communications and how WCA can try and uh, reach more people in our communities. So obviously... You all, you're all from community groups and you all know your local um, colleague, you know, colleagues in your groups and outside your groups too. And I would like to really understand, and perhaps we need a dedicated session for this another time, how, how can member groups reach more people in their community and what barriers do you currently have? Cultural barriers, you know, or belief system barriers or whatever they are, what, what are the barriers you're dealing with in, in gaining more membership to your cause? Um, and can indeed a climate activist group of any kind really appreciate, really um, attract the general public? You know, I, I have my doubts about that. So in order to get our message across more and to win more hearts and minds, I think we do need to create content that's not so contentious and a lot more simple, uh, you know, and more, more shareable, if you like, um, with anyone that isn't technically up on climate change, but that can understand the benefits of changing their life and moving to a more um, sustainable way of living. So I want to do a lot more social media and, and uh, I'm, I'm asking for your help uh, in the membership to um, come up with ideas, um, back of a postcard or to an e on an email to me, uh, but also to um, produce content from your groups about things you've done, you know, little videos. That video is so digestible and it's great because people don't like reading reams and reams of stuff, especially the general public. So examples of sustainable things you've done or projects you've done in your groups and share Let's share each other's content. If there's one thing you can do that's really effective, it's just press that share button on our social media for us and get it out beyond just the membership. That would be great. And then finally, there is a new council's, uh, there's a new initiative in the council for carbon literacy, and they want this to be disseminated through groups like ours out to the public. So they're producing, I heard about this just for the first time today, a toolkit for community groups to, to use to help people understand, um, uh, well, the importance of reducing their carbon footprints. Um, so if you'd like more information about any of that, I'll, I'll have it very soon. Um, and there'll be much more to come on this. I just wanted to give you a taster of the thinking at the moment. Greg, you've got a question. Yes, I, I want to respond to what you were just saying. Um, with the uh, EcoHub Alliance in Salisbury from our market stall every week, um, throughout the whole of the winter, we've been uh, using the leaflets from the Centre for Sustainable Energy in Bristol, which can be downloaded off their website. And because they were dealing with you know, so that saving energy, um, everything from 
solar panels to how to keep warm in winter without running up huge f fuel bills. Um, they were very pertinent to lots of people who otherwise wouldn't have come near a, a greenish type stall in the in the market, but they were actually receiving information and, and leaflets about their fuel bills and, and something that was really pertin pertinent to them. And so we did get a lot of interaction from people on, on that level. And in regard to carbon literacy and, and climate literacy, we've also started producing a, a series of our own leaflets of uh, bite-sized climate science. One of our members is a professor, Richard Sharp, who uh, used to work at Porton Down and be a visiting professor at uh, Liverpool University. And he's been writing stuff for um, XR in Salisbury on climate science. But it's you, you see his leaflets and it looks like you need a PhD to read them. And, and then he's written them for peer review for some journal. Um, so I've been working with him to produce far more simplified and popular bite-sized climate science leaflets that uh, are much more accessible to people and they've got pictures and one or two graphs and, and no print smaller than 12 point. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're very soon uh, going to get them up on our website so people will be able to download them and print them off themselves and use them wherever they like. Um, we're just waiting until people in the parks out of the way because the, the woman who's putting things up on our website is too busy doing people in the park until after that's out of the way. But um, congratulations! Yes, I, I agree entirely about about finding ways to get through to people who otherwise wouldn't engage. Well done, and Julie, you've made such a difference. And this slide is one of one of the most important ones of the whole uh, meeting today. I think. We're really addressing communications in a way we hadn't before. Bill. I'm going to be really controversial, Andrew, and say if we start on our next stage now, we won't be finished till nine o'clock. And I think that's unfair on the members. I think um, if everyone wants to continue, fine. I'm just, I, I, when we have the session about projects and what we want to do with projects, I think we need a real focus on it. And the danger of running it now is that we will run out of energy and uh, whatever to actually get something positive out of the meeting. I'm happy okay. to chat it over, over at a high level, but to, you know it is now five to eight. Um, you know this idea of telling people what you're going to tell us and then telling it and then saying what you have said. Could you do just a bit about telling us all <laughs> what we what? we're going to, to be doing when we address this. Are other people um, is uh, willing to postpone that to make this a, a, a shorter meeting? If Bill gives us a proper explanation, maybe we can put our minds to it in a very productive way and hit the ground running with it next time. What do other people think? Is that all right? Works for me, Andrew. Good, Bill, um, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, Keith, Keith, you had your slide. I think if we just work through the slides that we've done for the next stage, Keith had some, and, and just what um, this is what we <laughs> this is what we'd like to would like to do. We're going to do at this meeting, but suggest although it's a month away, I do believe that we can do something in the meantime. But I think if we just run through this, Keith, Keith, you want to do it? Yeah, sure. Um... What the whole focus is on from the, the viewpoints of the steering group, having spent some time thinking this through, is that our focus is about delivering pieces of work which then influence and hopefully eventually bring about a change that has a reduction in carbon across the county. So we think that means treating every action you do as a project. And projects are only workable if they meet these listed set of points, as far as I'm concerned. They're not viable unless the project can tick these boxes. First thing you have, if you've got any idea of a project, you've got to have someone who's willing to get behind it, put their shoulder on it and really lead it, become the sort of project champion and leader. That person needs a smallish expert team who are knowledgeable on the subject in hand. 
who I actually do the work. Too big a team, it'll get diluted. Too small a team, too much for everyone to do. My recent experience was on the, the business project, a team of sort of four or five active researchers. Searchers was manageable. The quality was good and you could get the people together to deliver. When it was 10 or so, it was too many. Um, only do projects with really clearly defined outcomes where you know what your deliverable is going to be and make it clear what you're, who it is you're trying to influence with your deliverable, who you're trying to get the change from, what's the influence effect, and that should therefore make you focus on what you need to produce. Um, it's all of no use at all. If you, if you produce a deliverable, you're unable to get the channels out and get it communicated. But sometime it might be, you know, amazing if you've got time in front of Wiltshire Council top meeting and said, I've got half an hour to address this, that'd be brilliant. But more often your target audience are diverse and spread around and very difficult to get hold of. Even though communications leapt on loads in the last 25 years, I sometimes think we've got so much of it going on now, you just can't actually get traction or get your viewpoint over. It's really, really difficult. So you have to have a plan. You know when you're going to do it and when you're going to complete. And I think probably if we're honest with ourselves, we should uh, deliver projects and then spend a bit of time saying, what did we learn about that project? What could we have done better? Did it actually get the level of uh, impact and change that we wanted? You know, my own business project is stuck in the position now where I've produced a document and a report, which people say is authoritative and well-written and a good piece of work. Actually getting that out there to people now and then getting people to absorb it and directing it towards all those who should be bringing about changing business across Wiltshire, proven to be really, really difficult. Okay, that's the what I think makes a viable project. Next slide. Here's a few examples. A project could really be anything. If the team involved think it's the right medium and method to get the desired outcome, so it could be like we've done recently, produce a, a really expert policy paper on solar farms or any subject, and use that to engage with people in the community. It could be, we need to do a consultation response by the end of March, let's get it done. It could be writing a detailed paper on a subject where we between ourselves of a mass of useful knowledge and we want to pass that on. Organising a protest or a rally. Bill delivered people to County Hall in Trowbridge on the 21st by leading a project to get it moving. It could be a coordinated lobbying on a particular subject. It might be getting all the members to write to MPs. A meeting, an event, something at a local group or county basis that delivers the project you want to the people you want to influence. So, I think it can be anything as long as it meets the criteria we said at the start. And then picking the one you really want to do, we think the most important things are which projects are likely to deliver the most carbon change in the time scale. Next slide. I think, Bill, at this point, these are a couple of examples of projects that you put forward if you want to. Thought through yeah, yeah, this this is just an example of something we could go for. And at the point yeah. of, the point that was going to be for the rest of this meeting was to have a real serious breakout session for people to discuss and start to grow a project that they decided was sensible for them. This is just an example or example. So first one, we create a platform where local communicants can look at grid management. Big, big, big subject. So I've already been told it's too big, but you know, it's something that has to be done to enable local co that a community to give their own energy security and effectively to save money on their energy as well. But we'd need to do things like policy papers for various things. We need so there's multiple policy papers, not one. Engagement with a local district network operator who is Scottish and Southern Energy, and with Wiltshire Council who are already doing some work on this. So we could either go on the back of work with council um, to, to develop four communities and then build community business model to show people how putting energy through uh, a, a microgrid or working with the, the DNO to provide a grid service to, to a community can deliver savings to the community. So that's a, one example. Next. Is there another one? Oh, okay. So 
this one is one I, I personally would like to pick up actually, which is trying to get the benefits of charging facilities to communities. So EV charging in communities. There is some work going on, but they're spending many minuscule amounts of money on it and it needs to be done properly for communities. Again, you can see all the enablers we need to have, but the outcome is to deliver local community owned charging networks for local and in transit use being delivered across the county. So we create this vehicle which enables local communities to do that. Okay, next. Oh, sorry. Next. It's not, oh. it's not moving. Okay, and again, uh, I mean, Keith pulled these out. These were some, actually, these came from our February meeting where we had groups who were talking about potential projects. So picking up those would be a really good thing to do as well. And there is, there's one for each of those four groups we had at the February meeting. There's land use, there was energy. Um, we won't talk again about the detail, but then the built environment and then transport. They don't have to be under those headings, but that's what our meeting of 80 people in, in devices came up with as things we should be addressing. Um, and I think that's just food for thought for us to work on the next meeting. So the outcome of our big workshop on this online would be to have, you know, hopefully three or four projects with, which got a, the things that Keith has talked about. Um, the project, which is uh, broadly defined, a lead for the project, a, a link to elements of which the council has own climate goals, so that we can go and work with the council. They've offered to do that with us, where we can identify our project. So we have an open door there, and then work out what the next steps of the project are. So that would be an outcome from the breakouts that we could have. Um, okay, I think that's all. But uh, uh, Keith, have you got any more to add? I think yeah, that last point was really interesting because that's a development from the last week or so, isn't it? If if there is a an indicator from the council that there's some of their key projects which match with ours, then that should influence where we put our effort to choose the projects which were most likely to succeed. Because yeah. if there's a a channel of delivery through to the council, and they're probably the most influential body within the county at bringing about change, one would hope. And we have to take that as a, a strong indicator that that's where we place our bets if we had to choose between a couple of projects. Yeah. Uh, and I just use I just use the the EV one as an example. They're spending a, like a hundred thousand pounds on EV infrastructure, which is which is a very, very, very small amount of money. Uh, and they're delivering something to, I think, 35 projects, but they're really, really small. And we need to get in there, in amongst it with them and say, actually, you could do it this way, you could do it that way, you could do it another way. And, and we can work out how to generate cash because the local community can own it through a community uh, interest company and all that sort of stuff. So they're doing it with the grant money they've got and nothing more. They're not looking for new money. They're not looking for anything. So we need to get stuck in and sort it with them. And that's just one of the many things we could do, be doing with the council. Andrew, does that help? Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And um, I think we should circulate something then, um, not shortly before next month's meeting, but a, a, a little while after this one, to get people thinking. What do what what do others think about that is that something we can feasibly do julian i think that's a good idea all i was going to suggest was that we usually like to have a little breakout session and even if we don't do the full thing it could be quite useful to have one to just think about the projects that we'd like to um, do together and you know come up with a sort of some outfits from that do you think um right now people game for that um what would be the timings then? I mean, I think that we want, really want to um, wrap up in, say, 15 minutes from now. People are welcome to, um, um, if, if you need to go, you can, you can go at any time. One or two people have left. Um, 
dividing into breakouts, let's be very clearly clear what the what the um topic is for the breakouts, if that's what we're going to do. Um, Bill, you suggested leaving this, but um, you going to have breakouts on this now? Have we got organised um, breakout uh, facilitators? That's something we would plan uh, to do. I, yeah, I think I think we're in a position where people like me have been in the chat are saying things now. I, I understand what you're trying to do, Julian, but you, the danger is we'll lose the the energy we need to actually deliver something tonight. And I'm really am. Um, it, it, you know, we can have a chat, but we're not going to get anything out of it. We just have a chat about what possible projects there might be and the, and the pitfalls. But um, that's what I mean. It's uh, just that, you know, we usually try and have a breakout every meeting, don't we, Bob? And I'm going to suggest that we have a one group breakout. In other words, we carry on with the <laughs> plenary meeting. Um, the yeah, whole the with that is that not so many people get a chance to actually speak. <laughs> well, uh, and and that we open the floor to people who haven't said anything, <laughs> which I'm not one of those. Um, so what was what was what's the question for the breakouts then? What was the proposal? Uh, Julian, remind me. Sorry, I, I was just suggesting. You know, what sort of project might we come along with next time and try and develop? What you know, what 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 project would we like to do? I mean, I said at the beginning, I'd like to know what projects some of our local groups are currently doing especially if they are doing um make a difference or trying to make a difference to the to greenhouse gas emissions um and i'm I, i'm actually with with bill resisting having going into breakouts and the overriding um factor i'm about got in mind is people's energy so i'm going to ask jeremy to unmute uh thank you um yeah, well, well, interesting. I mean, amazing. I mean, there's how many projects under the sun is um, phenomenal. Uh, I'm actually invested in co co charging, co charger. I think they're called, uh, who are rolling out EV points across the southwest, and they've run into a bit of a problem, uh, a little bit. Um, we're thinking of sort of trying to push for charging network in or across Wiltshire uh, could prove difficult, I think. I mean, it's a matter of uh, the state and or private enterprise. I mean, it needs both really, but um, I don't quite know how that could be. I mean, they're expensive things to negotiate. You know, they need a lot of power. I mean, somebody said that it cost a hundred grand just to put it up in their village hall. I think it was Hannah. Um, I'd rather like to see um, that, Every community has a cargo bike uh, for hire um, so that people can see them on the road, can get to use them, can facilitate their own lives, you know, using uh, this incredible bit of technology, uh, which is not expensive. Um, I mean, that's, that's my sort of <laughs> personal belief. Um, yeah, that's that's all I've got to say, really. I think I, I think I did have something else to say, but I can't remember what it was now. Thanks. Uh, is that an old hand or new hand? No, it's a, it's a new hand, really, because I, I, you know, the, the the number of people who are staying is dropping as we speak, and so that nobody's willing on go for a big breakout. And I, I'm left with this this question now: is you know, how much realism is it for people who are already busy members of their local member group in whichever town or village they are around the county to actually step forward and say they want to be involved in a project which is more county-wide and is focused on influence, say, Wheels the Council. Is it actually realistic to ask that question and does anybody have fair bandwidth to step forward and take on these new projects? Isn't it? I think you're asking, asking the wrong audience at the moment, Keith. Yeah, I, maybe my, I am. My, pers my personal view, as you know, is that if you don't ask, you don't get. And I, I think if it, the, that was the whole point of having the energy in the next meeting to be able to have a very frank discussion about that. So if we have the next meeting and after an hour's breakout groups, we come back and discover nobody's prepared to take on a project, then we know where we are. But at the moment, we're not asking the right audience. We're asking uh, uh, people who've just 
come to the end of a, a meeting. So I, I agree with you, the potential is there, but without asking the question in a full meeting and having the debate about what could be projects, because you, you highlighted, frankly, some quite small projects that people might be prepared to take on. I highlighted two massive ones. And, and, and you know, there is a big range of projects, as you say, you know, whether it be organizing an event or doing something else, actually you know, taking Julie's point in communication, you know the the small projects that we could we could put a template together as the Briggs was talking about to help people understand climate issues more fruitfully. That's a project. We could go out to communities and do that. That's a project. So, I mean, maybe maybe your point about a big project is quite correct. That only a few people would be prepared to take them on. And and you know, from my pet project, Jeremy's already pointed out. Jess has already pointed out. A number of issues but that would be dealt with in the project yes but because so that's the whole point of the project but yeah there are huge difficulties so how the bloody hell do you overcome them so, but on a small project you're creating a creating something fairly small that we can then launch out as a group like the policy paper so yeah, I, can we on, can we hear what? from some of the members because Brig, would you? <laughs> yeah, we'll shut up, Julie. I'll turn my. I'm going to take Kate first and then Brig. Okay. Hello. Um, so, problem solving, because that's essentially what it all comes down to. And it's something I spend a, a lot of time thinking about because my job, I work as an environmental officer for councils. So, um, how do you get people involved? So, one model you might like to explore is simply by finding someone who's willing to start a project and then adding it to your agenda and each week you kind of call out for help and say this is what we're trying to do all this month can we help so for example with your eb charging community charging project i'm absolutely not offering to take it on but i might be able to help with some information because it's something that i'm looking at in the role of my job kind of ev charging points so maybe if you think about it as kind of cathedral building starting the ball rolling and um, picking out a few projects and then each month saying this is what we're trying to do is anyone able to help? And if people are, you'll manage to kind of keep it going. And if not, at least it's on the agenda. So you kind of, you're still um, hopefully making some progress because I think it does feel quite overwhelming when there's so many things that all need doing and there's not enough people. It's the eternal problem of community groups and environmental groups, isn't it? Um, and also I just wanted to kind of say, um, there are a few, for example, again, thinking of working with the resources that we have. So if you have councils that, do have someone who is um, working on the environment, liaising with them and finding out how you can help. So again, sticking with EV charging points. I, um, so the council I work for, Chippenham, we can't put EV charging points on anywhere other than our land, but um, what would be useful to know to pass on to Wiltshire or for you to deal directly with Wiltshire is where on Wiltshire council land, are there places where people would want EV charging points? Because the officers, you know, they barely have time to do their jobs. So if you can do some of the engagement work for them to kind of, um, to get the information which would then help them progress. So perhaps another part of the answer is finding out which groups or organizations are already doing stuff and how you can maybe like fill in the gaps and then help those projects progress that way instead. Thank you. I agree with all of that, Kate. It, yeah. Greg. Yeah, it's been a, a while since I've been um, I've attended a, a Wiltshire Climate Alliance meeting because uh, certainly Wednesday evenings we have our Eco Hub meetings, and I came straight from an Eco Hub meeting that started at six to get to this one straight away at seven. Uh, so I certainly haven't got the bandwidth to take on extra projects, but I did want to thank you all for for having a, a wonderfully inspiring Wiltshire Climate Alliance meeting which I think I've very been very pleased to be part of. Thank you Brig. Um, Good can to I, see you again Brig. I think Brig can I just mention something uh, at our six o'clock um, pre-meeting for new new um, attendees Amy and Alistair who are still here amazing thank you <laughs> you guys um are attending for the first time they're new members and uh amy was particularly interested in retrofit fit. um she's in architecture and i know that julian's very passionate about that too so is it worth maybe um 
asking uh, anyone still here just to drop a note in the chat on to, on pro pro potential projects for discussion, and then we could organise um, an an offline session just about that topic. Yes, Amy. Hello. Hi. I was just actually typing in the chat about this. <laughs> Um, oh, great. <laughs> I think just a specific group about retrofit would be a great help. Um, I'm thinking there's a lot of people who want to improve their homes, but don't know where to start. So if we could share the load of just researching or share our experiences of what we've done effectively in our homes, or maybe people have got similar type of house that they could share um, what's worked or possible funding sources or good companies to use, because I think... There, I know so many people who want to make improvements but feel overwhelmed by the amount of information. So if we've got a group of people within this um, this group who could share, well, I think that'd be great. And it might open up to more people who haven't really got involved in this, I think, because it's it's not a climate, just a climate issue. It's, it's an economic one, fuel poverty. I think it's just so important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks. Yes, Bill. Yeah, I'm just going to talk to speak uh, uh, at uh, Amy's point. Um, the council are actually doing quite a lot as well to try and give a, a guidance on how you how to how to deal with retrofitting. Um, and it's again could be a joint project with with them because they're using CSE to help them. We could yeah. we could uh, we could jump on that uh, course as well and use it as a free resource to actually help us by going through the council. So you mm -hmm. could grow the retrofit ideas through the council link to CSE. Yeah, sounds good. And we did so we did actually do quite a lot of work on it last year. Uh, Tony Curran did a lot of work on it, uh, Kate. Yes, and there is actually a web page collecting exactly what you were saying there. Well, we need to pick it up again, and that's what I was thinking. I can't find it just at the moment. I'll try and find it and put it in the chat. Mm. Okay. Well, we've managed to say what we were going to say. Lots in the chat about projects and and some people have spoken to us about uh, projects, this and that. Um, in, I like insulate street by street. I think you don't just mean devices, do you, Margaret? No. Uh, and uh, so I think we've, we, we've got an obvious um, main focus for next month's meeting and some things that we can do in between. Perhaps um, I, I can help work on an email to, to go to member groups um, to find out where they're at, because one idea is that we find out what projects they want to do and put them together in twos and threes so that we're actually helping people to do things. Because, Keith, you were right. People can't take on infinite amounts. But if they're already doing something in two or three local groups, we can put them together with one of us and uh, make that into a much bigger thing, scale it up. Um, lots, lots to think about. I think this uh, has been a brilliant meeting, and I'm glad you thought so too, Brig. Um, and uh, thanks for being here. And uh, would you be able to let people have some of the leaflets that you're producing already for Big Green Week in June, the ones that where you're editing Professor Sharp's work? If they crossed your palm with silver, can't hear you, Brig. Uh, I don't need any uh, crossing of the palm with silver, but if anyone did want to make any donations to to, climate, to um, the Eco Hub Alliance, that would be good. But if uh, I put my email in the in the chat, if anybody wants, I can put the those new leaflets that we produced. Um, in my Dropbox and send a link to anybody who wants a link so they can download them and print them off for themselves. Right. And I think um, that those of us who are in the steering group have given us, given ourselves more work than usual after this meeting. <laughs> so, and if anyone wants to join the steering group, please do. <laughs> so that we can all leave. <laughs> <laughs> and Last one out, yeah. <laughs> you're looking at members of the steering group, you're looking at Bill, Andrew, Julie, um, Brig, Julian, um, Keith, 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 
and we're down to one screen full of people. We were two screens full of people. Um, hard working from time to time, I, I'll, I'll call us. So I'm, I'm now um, any other business. Otherwise, I'm declaring the former part of the meeting uh, over. Thanks for well, being I'd like to declare. Yeah. Sarah, I'd like to declare that, you... that I'm an ex-member of the steering group because I <laughs> had to make more bandwidth to do the eco hub. All right, yeah. then. Yeah, I was a bit out of date. Sarah T. <laughs> it's fine. I'll email someone and ask about it. I think everyone is desperate to go, aren't they? <clears throat> <laughs> I'm happy to stay until there's only one person left, and that's me. Sarah, it'd be, <laughs> it'd be great to tell you more about uh, the steering group and the power we have over Wiltshire's climate. Um, and so one of us could definitely get in touch or you can just what what would be the email contact at which climate alliance i wanted julie to give us an email address do you want it to be julie or comms at which climate alliance because you said please send in your ideas uh at one point oh just uh yeah to the con i think uh yeah to, con yeah. to contact would be fine contact contact because a few of us see that contact yeah. at Sarah. And where are you based, Sarah? I'm in Shrewton, but I don't know when or how the student group meetings happen, um, but I'll email Julie. It's, it's a miracle that they happen at all. Yay! <laughs> and and so them. If people wanted to have student group meetings in the daytime, for instance, people with children, people who are tired at night, people who are working shifts, um, I think we need to accommodate the needs of people who are willing to give it a try. And um, that's that's all I'll say. Um, thanks for raising a hand there, Sarah. Fruit and great place. Jeremy. Um, yeah, just I want to say, what do I want to say? I want to say that it feels like we're swimming against the tide of central government, you know, and until that turns, that tide turns, it's going to be hard work for groups like ours um, to really fire things up you know you need to feel that you're sort of supported by legislation you know when you've got things like licenses being handed out at Rosebank and you know elsewhere in the North Sea you've got uh, you know human rights abuses against protesters um, there's you know you've got uh, tax rebates to fossil fuel uh, developers what we do, what we do, it's not scratching the surface, you know. It's like, I, don't, I mean, I don't mean that to be. What I mean is, we. I think we need to reserve our energies a little bit, and I, I know that sounds a bit counterintuitive, but until this government effing collapses, you know, it's going to be hard work, and I don't feel like really doing hard work for little return. Can I can I join in there because I I I um, um don't have much bandwidth but such bandwidth that I have is in my view best directed to the fact that we're going to have a general election within about a year or so and I think everyone needs to be focused on what is going to go into the manifestos because there's one thing I've learned from looking at all the elm stuff I've done it's I don't think we'd have elms the agricultural payment scheme at all if it hadn't been so clear in the Conservative 2019 manifesto that they were going to be all green and, and so on for farmers. I think it's really important that we support people to contact people and, and that might be via council, council. The councils don't have the power, the resources to do the things that we want them to do. So we, we need to think about what's going to be in those manifestos and, and how we could influence what's in each manifesto for each party um, and how that would support other councillors to do the work we want them to do. Oh, hear, hear. That's exactly <laughs> the book on my so, list so of projects. you just set yourself up as a project. <laughs> no. Oh, oh. <laughs> Claire, I, I will support you on that project because I've, I wanted to uh, launch a people's manifesto for the climate or for the planet, if you like. Um, mm, that's a good idea. Whatever mm. is more accessible to the most people, but a people's manifesto, yeah, that we can drive up to the next election. I think that's... Yeah. But I, I think it's before that because it's what goes in the manifestos and it's no good waiting for the election. 
yeah, I think we yeah. need to apply pressure now because I've just been Googling who writes the manifestos. I mean, the Labour Party has a you know really long process because it all goes through conference and blah, blah, blah. The Conservatives, I think, I don't know, but I think they just sort of um, appoint somebody who, you know, writes it all out and everybody else has to, you know. Make it up as they go along. Yeah. Take part of that. But I mean... Mm -hmm. The stuff that I know about was was obviously all written by Michael Gove well before the the 2019 general election, I would say. So who's doing that now? That's what I want to know. Mm. Well, and if we if we could draft something from mm. county, we could then take it to other counties and get their backing for it as well. Mm. Mm. Because we've started to liaise with other county groups, so it would be really yeah, good. that would be that would be really good because that's that's the, the the big thing because I think a lot of people think that manifest. I've just been looking at the manifestos. Manifestos are not implemented at all. You know, they're just written out and they're tossed away. Well, they're not fully implemented, but um, at least half the government's manifesto, I think, has been implemented, and the uh, Elm stuff, the agricultural stuff has been implemented sort of i think if it hadn't been for that manifesto i think when liz trust came along uh, you know if she'd stayed a bit longer it would have been out the window none of it would have survived at all so it's really important what goes in the manifestos i think excellent i like yeah. that could i make a quick comment about the labor when you did it's a very long process but in, in practice i think the labor one also gets just sort of written mm. <laughs> well i think what they do they I, I might be wrong through the formal process, but the election, the actual manifesto is just written. I, yeah. to, I, I think they have conference and and it's sort of, you know, all these policies are there and they sort of pick, pick and exactly. sort of, yeah. you know, and it's we, like a lucky dip as to which one comes out, I think. I'm well, not sure. Yeah, there's a conservative environment network and there's the uh, an organisation called CIRA, which is the Labour sort of uh, equivalent. And mm. we can engage with both those organisations. So mm. I, I think that's a very good idea. Mm-hmm. 